Hi everyone, welcome back to Too Cool for Middle School. Today I wanted to tell you about kind of a creepy story unit that you could use for the fall time, Halloween time, whatever. And then in like a larger sense, just talk about ways that we can use these old kind of like gothic stories in the 21st century and apply different lenses to them and find a way to make them more relevant to today. For me, that's actually like so much fun. I also have to tell you that this lesson is Jordan Peele approved. And at the end of this video, I will tell you the story of how I met him and what we talked about and why I got excited about this lesson all over again. The horror story that we're gonna be talking about today is called The Monkey's Paw by W.W. Jacobs and it was published in 1902. Let me know down in the comments if you ever read this story as a kid or if you've taught it as a teacher. It's a pretty popular story and the theme that most people take away from it is be careful what you wish for. There have been a couple movies that are like loosely based on the premise of the story and just kind of quickly the plot is basically there's this older couple who live out on this kind of abandoned road. It's in England and they have an adult son and it opens with the father and the son playing chess by the fireplace and they're expecting an old friend of the father's to come by and visit even though it's kind of rainy and gloomy outside of course. So this friend has been a sergeant in the army all this time and he's been stationed in India. He comes over to tell them about his adventures in India but what he ends up showing them is this shriveled monkey's paw, which he received from a fakir in India. And a fakir is like kind of a magical person, but maybe at like a flea market type of a thing. So this paw is supposed to give you three wishes and those three wishes will come true. But so far, everyone who has made their wishes with this monkey's paw has regretted it. The sergeant regrets it as well, but this family, probably just like everybody else who comes across it, thinks, well, we could make the right wish so that we won't regret it if we have this paw. So the sergeant does like throw it into the fire, but they end up pulling it out and they make a wish. They wish for money in the amount of 200 pounds. The next day, their son goes to work in a factory, and then someone comes to their door, tells them he has been killed in a tragic accident in the factory, but they will be receiving a payment of 200 pounds as compensation for the loss of his life. So they, of course, regret this decision. Uh, the, the son is buried. The wife is just so overcome with grief that she runs down at night and finds the monkey's paw and wishes that he would come back, that her son would come back. He's buried about a mile away, I think the story says. So about 20 minutes later, there's this knock on the door. Her husband has seen the body and how mangled it was by this factory accident. And so he doesn't want to let the son in if that is who is outside of their door in the middle of the night. So they make one last wish and we don't know what that wish is. And the story ends. It's a short story. <laughs> you can read it fairly quickly. This is, you know, one of the reasons why it's used in school. For one, because it's public domain, the copyright, you know, has expired so they can put it in textbooks for free. <laughs> That's why they choose a lot of these stories. Um, and, sorry, my hands are feeling dry. Um, it has a lot of great examples of like showing, not telling. You know, it's not actually gruesome in the descriptions, but your imagination takes you to where the author wanted you to go and you're like, oh, so gross. So anyway, this is a, you know, a, a common story. You can find the PDF online or for us, it was in our textbook. So um, I created some slides last year for virtual learning. So we used these via like Nearpod so that I could see, you know, that everybody was like 
keeping up. Um, and so we would do everything together in Nearpod and then they would just be expected to like fill out their own slides with the same exact questions. And then these were all due by the end of the unit. Our timing was a little bit different last year, but it, it definitely took more than one period. Like, I guess if you're meeting with your students every day, it could maybe take a week to go through this, maybe like three days to a week, um, depending on how long your discussions go. And there are quite a few videos embedded within this, so it kind of depends on if you're doing like a flipped classroom thing and you have them watch the videos mostly at home or if you use class time. So it'll kind of depend on just how you decide to use this. But let me tell you a little bit about what we did and the ways that we really dug into this story and made it much more interesting for us today. So these are Google Slides. If you get them on Teachers Pay Teachers, that makes it really easy to put them into something like Pear Deck or Nearpod if you want to do it that way, or you can just like display these on your board. You can post them for your students on Google Classroom, however you like to do it. So um, the first slide is just like where you can find the story. So I've linked it if it's not in your textbook, but for us, we were using the collections curriculum for eighth grade and we just had it already. So for me, I just linked that. Now, it begins with a chess game. And I, I researched WW Jacobs as best as I could, and I couldn't find nearly as much information about him as I wanted to. If I were getting like a PhD in literature, I feel like he as an author would be a really interesting subject for research. But from the little that I do know about him, I feel like everything in this story is very, very purposeful. So that's how I'm reading it. I'm assuming that it is. So um, here's the quote that we look at. Father and son were at chess. The former, who possessed ideas about the game involving radical changes, putting his knight into sharp and unnecessary perils that had even provoked comment from the white-haired old lady knitting placidly by the fire. So the first thing we did was watched a TED Ed video about the history of chess. Guess where chess originates? India. And then it is kind of like adapted, you know, through trade in, in different areas of the world and eventually it makes its way to Europe and it's kind of adapted into the version that we use today, but the origination is in India. And I think that's very significant to the story. So the next question is, um, what does the father's chess strategy tell us about his character? He puts his king into sharp and unnecessary perils. So that's a foreshadowing of what he might do with the monkey's paw later. So already we're going much deeper than just surface level. Okay, so now we get into the setting. All of these kind of gothic horror stories have similar settings, like an old Victorian home in the English countryside, and it's always nighttime and windy and dark and rainy and all of that. So of course, we gotta take a look at that. Now, Sergeant Major Morris comes in next, and so, we ask where he was for the last 21 years, and I'm always asking them for text evidence. This story is written in a style that would have been more common for 1902 than 2021, so it does take a little bit of getting used to, but if they can pull out sentences that prove something that you're asking them about, that helps give them practice um, in just like you know, reading this kind of different type of language. And it gives them confidence that like, yes, even though I might not understand like every single word in this sentence or the exact way that the syntax is put together, I know what this is trying to say. So here's where I've never seen anyone take this story. I, I checked on like JSTOR to see if people had written scholarly articles about this. Um, just from my own searching online, I have not seen anybody else take it in this direction. So I think this is interesting. Jensen thinks it's interesting too. So the, who's this guy? You wanna tell us? No. Okay. <laughs> Be careful of my coffee, please. Who is that guy? Venom. Okay, let's uh, keep him out of the frame. Thank you. Okay. So the history of British imperialism is very, very important in this story. So I've linked some videos about the history of British imperialism, which in the United States, we don't learn a ton about. I guess that students would do that more like in high school. But as far as I remember from my school and just kind of like what I see students doing today, I don't think it's like a really 
big unit. But as far as like history with global impact, this is hugely important. So, you know, if, if students encounter this history several times in their academic career, that is great. So I have this uh, six minute video about the East India Company. Okay. So students will list three facts about the East India Company. And then the next video is just a section of a crash course video about imperialism. So this is a John Green video. It's like a minute and a half. Um, and so this gives us a little bit of insight into what Sergeant Major Morris might have been doing for these past, what was it, 21 years in India. So I think typically when you read this story, you just kind of gloss over that part, but what has he been doing all this time? And maybe in 1902, as like contemporary readers are reading this story, you know, knowing that this is a sergeant based in India, they would have like filled that information in on their own. Uh, then I found some interesting images of the British in India. I don't think I'd ever really seen these before, but it just gives us like a sense of Sergeant Major Morris's experience there. Um, and then I found a little bit longer video about the Sepoy Rebellion, which happens before this story is published, so I'm assuming it's just like set at the same time that it's published. Um, but that would explain why maybe there were an increased number of British troops in India after that. So I think all of this background information is really, really relevant. <laughs> For the next part, um, I've also linked a video montage of monkeys. So this is mostly like people on vacation getting their food and cameras and sunglasses and things stolen by monkey's little paws. And many of my students actually are from India or have family in India, so they've visited and they, they have been there and seen what it's like in real life. And so they have experience with monkeys. And so then I asked them like, what are monkeys like? What do they do? What do they use their paws for? And they use their paws to steal everybody's stuff, right? They're very quick, they just snatch things. So it seems like we're taking a little bit of a detour, but we're pulling these threads together about the history of British imperialism, what a monkey does with its paw, and then we're bringing it back into the story. So here's where, of course, you know, you gotta ask your students, if you had three wishes, what would you wish for? And they've already, you know, read the story so of course they're trying to like figure out how they would word it so that nothing bad happens to them as a result of their wish so this part is also really fun too and then you can have students share their wishes and everything so as you can see like you could go through this kind of quickly or you could like stop and reflect a little bit more on each of these sections it's really up to you but there's a lot of fun stuff to do within this unit okay and then this is an interesting question sergeant major morris says that he does not want anyone else to face the curse of this paw and he throws it in the fire. But do we think he was like using reverse psychology and he was just trying to get the whites to take it from him? It seems like that's kind of embedded within the curse, is that like somebody has to take it from you in order for you to be released from it. So the text explicitly says that he's not trying to give it to them, but... Here's where students can kind of like read between the lines a little bit and they get to decide, do you, do you think that he intended with his visit to make sure that they took it? Is that why he traveled down this dark dirt road that was difficult to navigate in the middle of the night because he was desperate to get rid of this monkey's paw? Or maybe not, maybe he's honest. That's another thing with horror is we're always like questioning everybody's motives, questioning everything, right? <laughs> so now we've just gotten into part two. So um, we compare the settings, how do they open differently from part one to part two. Things seem to be going well as we enter into part two, but of course the happiness never lasts. So then I also have them just like go online and figure out like how, about how much is 200 pounds in like 1900, how many dollars would that be worth today? So they can get a, a sense of like about how much money they wished for. Here's another section where we are only using quotes so that they can practice engaging with this language. So for wish number one, what is the wish? They have to type that in. And then what is the consequence of the wish? 
and then they can have a discussion, you know, explain in their own words, what does that actually mean? And it, it really makes you feel very smart as you're like using the direct quotes from the story, but then explaining what it actually means. Like the kids get a lot of confidence from being able to do that. And I think that this type of a, a story that's pretty short and accessible, even though it is kind of hard with like just the, the syntax and everything. But if you can walk them through it and they realize they can do it, they can understand this, then it opens up a little bit more literature to them and makes them feel less daunted by, you know, some of this old language. And then we do the same thing with wish number two. So find a quote in the story. What did they wish for? But what is the consequence? Now for the third wish, we don't actually find out what it is, but they can make a prediction. What do they think that wish was and what do they think the consequence is? And you know, you'll have to use like textual evidence or even just kind of like reading between the lines of the story in order to answer that. So if you wanted them to write a short essay or a paragraph, this would be a good prompt for that little bit longer writing assignment. So a lot of this stuff is just like building up to something that they can write a little bit more about. Um, but this is just like getting them started on those thinking trails, but you can like extend it kind of anywhere you want. Okay, so that's really like the end of the story, but there are more things to look at about this story. So here's where we get into post-colonial criticism, which is something that they would do in college, not in like eighth grade or high school, but they, they can. So this is something where you can tell them like, this is totally a college skill, but it's something that, you know, we're going to try out right now because you guys are so smart. I think you totally get this. You know, we're, we're going to look at this and see if you guys can apply it. For me personally, as I'm reading old stories and stuff like this, this is always the kind of thing I'm doing in my mind is applying these different critiques to the stories or these different lenses. You could call it a lens if you would like. So I tried to break it down for a little bit more like middle school, high school friendly way of understanding it. So it says, post-colonial criticism is a way of looking at stories that are set during a colonial period. And we've seen like British imperialism, they're colonizing India and thinking specifically about how colonization affected the author, the depiction of the characters in the story and the themes. And you could apply this to a lot of old stories and books. And then I also clarify that criticism simply means reading a story while looking for specific things like colonialism. So criticism doesn't mean like we hate it and we are looking for everything bad about it. A, a critique or, or the process of criticism is just what scholars do when they are looking at a text that thousands and thousands of people have read before, but is there a way that I can maybe find something new by applying this different lens or critique to it? So can we read The Monkey's Paw through a post-colonial lens? I and Jordan Peele think we can. So we're gonna need to know a little bit about the author in order to do that. So like I said, there's not a ton of information about W.W. W. Jacobs, but I found a little bit. And one thing I know is that he worked in the docks in London, and so did his father. And so just thinking about how docks and shipping and uh, you know bringing in items from other places, uh, meeting sailors from other places, like how might that experience in 1900 in London, how might that have impacted his view of the world? And my theory is that it made him a little bit critical of all this stuff that we were just sucking out of India <laughs> or that England was just sucking out of India and just taking all the time. This is a theory, I don't have hard proof, but I think that's kind of what he's saying in this story. Okay, so then we're just practicing applying this lens or applying this critique to the story. So where can we see the effects of British colonialism in W.W. Jacob's life? You know, he works with the actual products of colonialism as he does whatever he does at the docks, you know, processing all of this tea, cotton, maybe all of these things from India that Britain has this thirst for. Um, and then Sergeant Morris, he's directly tied to British colonialism. And we have the old fake year. So he is a colonized person. And I think that people kind of just skip over 
him a little bit when reading this story, but like, let's stop and take a little look at him. Why does he curse this monkey's paw and give it to British officers? <laughs> Is this to teach them a lesson about snatching and taking things that are not theirs? Because it's gotta be significant that this actual item, because it's pretty gross, it's this shriveled monkey's paw, so what could that monkey's paw represent? And the hint is to look at those videos. Monkeys are always stealing and taking things that are not theirs. So perhaps all of the consequences in this story are a result of the curse of the figure on these British imperialists taking all kinds of things that are not theirs. See how much more interesting this is when you actually like consider the historical context and apply a literary lens to it, then it's not just this old dusty story. It's actually something interesting. Now I taught this to eighth graders and it was a little bit hard to like <laughs> pull all of those threads together. Um, it was also online. This was all virtual. So that's a little bit harder as well. I think in person, this would go a little bit better, but um, then you can have them write one paragraph about how British colonialism in India impacts the plot or theme of the monkey's paw. Maybe it's a little bit deeper than just be careful what you wish for. Because I think these hints scattered throughout the chessboard, Sergeant Major Morris, the fact that it's a monkey's paw, all of these things I think uh, are not insignificant. Okay, now we're gonna do one more thing. We're gonna take this to one other place. I thought it was very interesting that W.W. W. Jacobs actually wrote a lot more works of comedy than horror. He's mostly known for this story, for the monkey's paw, but he wrote a bunch of humorous stories and they're linked here. You can find them. You can have your students read some of them. Um, and so that just reminded me of Jordan Peele, who started off in comedy and then is now like the king of horror. And there are some really interesting interviews online and little like analyses and critiques of his work um, about how comedy and horror are very, very similar. Like they have a very similar setup and then a similar twist at the end. But for comedy, it's this unexpected, like funny thing. And then for horror, it's this unexpected, scary thing at the end of this kind of like preposterous setup. So I have my students watch these two videos. So again, like this is, this is definitely more appropriate for like upper middle school, high school, looking at like Jordan Peele movies and stuff. But um, it's, it's just really interesting to see like the genius of this type of writing and to break this down a little bit more. I gave my students this bonus question and asked them, how are Jordan Peele and this story connected? And I'll tell you in a minute, but you should know, you should know this. <laughs> okay, so then for the very last slide, it just says, most people say the theme of the monkey's paw is be careful what you wish for, but what is another possible theme? and explain your thinking. So, you know, maybe, maybe we could go a little bit deeper. Maybe we can reimagine the monkey's paw a little bit. So, story time, finally. <laughs> so, the answer to the bonus question is that Jordan Peele's production company is called The Monkey's Paw. And so I thought that was so interesting. Also, I was like, I'm like putting all this together for this lesson and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is like, this is all connected, this is so cool. So. A couple of weeks ago, I actually met Jordan Peele at a birthday party in LA. He has a little kid that's like around Jensen's age. I was like, oh my gosh. So I ended up talking to him about this. I was like, I have to tell you, you know, you have Monkey's Paw Productions. Well, I teach the story, The Monkey's Paw, to my eighth graders. It's in our textbook. And I gave him like a little rundown of how we do this like post-colonial criticism of the story and how maybe, you know, it's really like the revenge of the fake year and how the author worked at the docks in London. And so maybe that was like actually his original intent with this story and trying to get people in London in the early 1900s to kind of like see that. And um, Jordan Peele thought that was like a totally valid read of this story. I thought that was really interesting. So we talked about that for a while. And then I told him how I have like, you know, this bonus question about the monkey's paw. So I asked him like, so you must have read this story maybe like in middle school or something. Like how did that end up becoming the name of your production company? And he said that, you know, 10 years ago or something, he came out to LA. 
he was doing comedy, he was doing Mad TV, and that was like supposed to be the dream come true. He got everything he wished for, but he hated it. Turned out to not be what he wanted. It ended up being, you know, this curse, this be careful what you wish for. So then when he started his production company and now he does almost exclusively horror stuff, he named it Monkey's Paw Productions as kind of like a reminder of, you know, being careful what you wish for. Plus it totally goes with like the horror theme. So it's like such a perfect name for his production company. So that made me so much more excited about this unit this year. And this year I'm not teaching eighth grade <laughs> English, so I don't get to teach it. So I shared it with all the people this year who are teaching eighth grade English. <laughs> and I'm like, you guys should totally do it. I wish I could contact my all my eighth graders from last year and tell them like, I actually got to ask Jordan Peele about this because we wondered, we were like, ooh, I wonder why he named it. Monkey Spa Productions. So anyways, you guys can use this story. It is on Teachers Pay Teachers. I uploaded it a year ago before I had like added like all of the resources. Cause I was like talking about it on Instagram. And so then people were like, oh, well, can you just upload like what you have so we can just get started on it. So I made it like a dollar and it was just like this growing resource. But then I think people who like didn't see the Instagram stories like bought it and it wasn't quite done. So they gave it four star reviews instead of five star reviews. So if you buy it, could you go in there and give it five star reviews instead? Cause honestly, I know I'm a little biased, but like this is the best monkey spot resource you're gonna find. I mean, like it's Jordan Peele approved, come on. <laughs> <laughs> this takes it so much further than any other like plot chart lesson. So this is like really good. <laughs> so I would love for you to teach it. I would love to see how your students interact with it and the questions that they come up with and everything. And then also just keep these like ideas in mind. Anytime you're teaching a story or a novel from a hundred years ago, particularly if it's like, you know, Rudyard Kipling or, um, there are there's a lot of literature that comes out of England during this time that is either set in India like Jungle Book even like the Secret Garden or it's kind of like the backstory to plots like um oh what was I watching Downton Abbey there are like the cousin whoever like that Scottish cousin guy like gets sent to India um in the call the midwife um i think it was chummy's family they were stationed in india so like this is a a common backdrop in a lot of these stories for hundreds of years <laughs> so if you're ever teaching a story or a novel like that like don't forget that element because that probably informs